welcome to those of you who have joined us to the episode seven of the Home and Energy Chats webinar series. Tonight, we are talking all about mold. My name is Heather Chandler, and I am the owner and publisher of the Green and Healthy Maine Homes magazine uh, and uh, webinar series. We have a great lineup tonight with some of the foremost experts on indoor air quality and mold, and I'm very excited that you have tuned in to join us. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor for this year's Home and Energy Chats, Royal River Heat Pumps, specializing in the comfort and efficiency of your home. Royal River Heat Pumps offers the highest quality electric heat pump installation and service in Maine. Call for a no cost site visit with one of their design experts or check them out online at royalriverheatpumps.com. I would also like to thank our season sponsors, Bath Savings, a local Maine bank that proudly invests in the people, places, and businesses that make Maine strong, your neighbor, your bank, and Seneca Construction Services, now offering net zero ready design build packages, conveniently located just minutes from Portland, Freeport, and Brunswick. So thank you to all of our Home and Energy Chat sponsors. A uh, quick overview of the evening. We're going to begin the, the webinar with a presentation from our panelists and then open it up to a Q&A led by our moderator, Christy Crocker. So please submit any questions you have for our panelists using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to get to all of them. Um, we will also be sending a follow-up email with some links as well as contact information for our panelists. So if you have follow-up questions, that'll be a great way to connect with them. Um, if you are unfamiliar with us, Green and Healthy Maine Homes is a multimedia brand dedicated to inspiring healthy, sustainable, energy smart, and future ready Maine homes through an online business directory, biannual print magazines, monthly email newsletters, and an active social media presence. We share expert advice to inspire healthy, comfortable, affordable, efficient and sustainable main homes. So please visit us at greenmainhomes.com to learn more. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Christy Crocker, who will then introduce our panelists. Christy is the executive director of the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council, a nonprofit organization formed in 1998 to create healthy, productive and environmentally sustainable indoor environments through education, communications, and advocacy. She also serves as a member of the Green and Healthy Maine Homes Advisory Board and is a wealth of knowledge about issues related to indoor air quality. So thank you for joining us, Christy, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Heather, and welcome everybody to a nice evening program. Um, we are ready to answer your questions about mold and indoor air quality this evening. I wanna introduce the two other panelists that we have here uh, with us this evening. Uh, first is Ron Lassard. Ron is a certified industrial hygienist and he is the current president elect for the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council and he serves on the council's board of directors. He has an extensive career in environmental health and safety, which has allowed him to keep people healthy for over 30 years. It is Ron's personal mission to protect employees, building occupants and the public from preventable diseases and injuries. Um, I also want to introduce Erin Boutno. She is the technical manager of the Indoor Air Quality Labs at Northeast Laboratory Services and is the current president of the board of directors of the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council. She has a passion for aerosol science. She's a total nerd, just saying. Yes. Um, and she's <laughs> brought, and that her passions have brought her into a world of numerous seminars, research articles, and very heavy textbooks all in the name of creating healthy indoor environments. So as I said, she's a nerd and you're gonna love her. <laughs> I'm excited to have all of you with us this evening and I know you're gonna find the session very informative. So that's enough with me for right now. We'll be monitoring the Q&A feature in the background. We'll try to answer some questions right there in the Q&A feature. We may be putting some resources into the chat box, but um, above all, we wanna make sure we get those questions answered. So for now, we're gonna pass it over to Aaron and Ron. Thank you very much, guys. And I'll be in the background helping you out. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Christy. Definitely feel free to put as much as you want in the chat. Um, Christy's really great um, with that. So feel free to type away as we're going. Um, one great thing I think might be helpful for folks if they haven't taken a look at the article so far published in the Green and Healthy Homes magazine is the article um, listed here. It has a whole plethora of information. Um, it's segmented for a lot of different questions already in there and some other things that we just might not even cover in tonight's session. So maybe Christy or Heather can link that article in the chat for folks if you haven't already taken a look at it. I think it's a great starting point when you're worried about mold or thinking about mold or trying to deal with it, it's a good starting place, at least from there. So next. So at least when we hear the word mold, uh, it tends to get a little confusing as to what that actually means. So it, basically we try to back ourselves off as Christy said, I am a nerd. Um, and so I try to think through a scientific lens of when somebody says mold, what do they mean um, exactly? And it could actually just mean a number of different things. You know, some people come to me and they say, oh, I have a mildew problem, or I have a mushroom growing on the wood that I'm about to burn, or I have mold on my window. All of those different words and terms, even yeast, um, all of that falls into the word fungi. It all means the same thing, and technically that's the most accurate thing to call what it is that Ron and I do. We deal with fungi. It's all of this different um, types of organisms that basically what they do is they just produce spores and it feeds on organic material. Basically, that's just what they do. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know, mold, or if they say mildew, ultimately we're all talking about the same thing. It's just different general words that people use, but it's all treated. It's all thought of in the same manner. Next. So the major thing when thinking about mold is how does it grow in our indoor environments? Uh, that's the, kind of an easy way uh, for us to kind of manage it is how does it grow in the first place? And what mold needs is kind of three key things. And the, one of the first things is it needs food. It needs something to eat, kind of like a plant or us. It needs a food source. Uh, so that can be things, you know, like wood or dust, even, and some people will have those new windows that are plastic, but they'll have mold growing on that plastic and the mold isn't actually growing off of plastic. It's growing on the settled dust that's on there because that's still an organic material. It's skin, it's hair, you know, as gross as that is, it's a food source for mold to grow on. Ron, do you have anything else about different food sources for mold? No, um, well, they do have a few favorites. They do, they do love the the paper on drywall, mm -hmm. as we all know, and they love uh, cellulose, cellulose ceiling tiles. Cellulose is a wonderful food for for fungi. Yeah, absolutely. Next. So another ingredient that mold and fungi need in order to grow is the right temperature. And lucky for us, we don't like our homes to be too cold and we don't like them to be blazing hot. We kind of like this nice neutral medium temperature and fungi like that same thing. So we can't try to freeze it out and we can't try to heat it out because Ultimately, us and all these mushrooms, we kind of like the same temperature range. So that's something to kind of keep in mind that temperature is an ingredient that mold needs in order to grow. But just because it likes the same ranges of temperatures that we like, it's not something that we can really prevent. Next. So the last ingredient that it needs is water. So kind of like a house plant, if you don't water it, it's not going to grow. Um, you know, you give it the soil, you give it that right temperature, but if you don't water it, it's just going to die. Mold is in the same lens. So if you don't give it that water component, then it's not going to be able to grow. Um, Ron, do you want to talk about some just key moisture regions of a house or how water gets into buildings? Yeah, there's a few ways. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the obvious leaks. So you've all probably had a plumbing leak here and there in your house. Um, so that's water kind of uh, getting out of a system. Um, also on your plumbing, your cold water plumbing, especially, you can have condensation. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
but um, you know the, the the moisture that's in the air can condense on the cool pipes, and then that moisture can drip onto something that might be a food source uh, for fungi. And then there's the leaks um, in your in your building envelope itself, and in, in, you know the outside of your house. The, do the windows leak, or are there are there problems where sections of the building come together and water's getting in? Um, so those those kinds of leaks as well. Um, so people often think about leaks, but condensation is also huge, probably even more important to think about. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about condensation and where you can look for that. Yeah, next. <clears throat> so when we're thinking through the lens, okay, so how did mold get in our house? You know, it should be growing outside in a forest, you know, eating away all those dead trees and, um, you know, organisms. But and when we're dealing with our home, we kind of have to remember these three key ingredients. It really kind of levels out and, you know, and humbles yourself and think, okay, well, I can't remove the food because we're not going to live in a glass box. And even if we did, we're still going to have dust and skin and hair around our house. So we can't eliminate that. Same with the temperature. We live in the same temperature range. And so when dealing with how mold grows inside, it's from that moisture component and all those items that Ron was mentioning, you know, keeping an eye out from where the water comes from is kind of the best way to deal with mold. You have to remember if you remove that one component in those three ingredients, then ultimately you're solving the mold problem at the same time. So often people will think, mold is the issue they're trying to fix when in reality, what they're really fixing is a water problem. Anything else on that one, Ron? No, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about, a uh, little bit more about where we're gonna find our mold problems. Yeah, so on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, you probably out there in the audience have, have, have had, had experiences where you found mold in your house. Um, so places that we have uh, frequent mold growth include basements. Um, here in Maine, uh, in the summertime, especially, you know, June to maybe midway through September, uh, we have some pretty humid air in, in Maine, and we have some pretty cool basements. You know, those basement walls and materials in your basements can all stay pretty cool, you know, maybe even below 60 degrees. Um, and what that does is it sets up a condensation potential. So, um, we should probably talk a little bit about, a little bit about dew point um, because it's going to be a recurring theme. Um, so air air can hold a certain amount of moisture depending on on the temperature of the air mass. So the the warmer the air mass, the more moisture the air can hold. And dew point is the temperature to which we must cool air um, to to make the air fully saturated with, with moisture. It can hold no more moisture. And if we cool it anymore, water's coming out of the air. And that's how it rains. Um, but it's also how, how moisture condenses onto surfaces. So if we have a surface in our house that's below the dew point, the air immediately adjacent to that cool surface uh, is, gonna, is gonna end up being below the dew point, the air temperature, and moisture is gonna condense out of the air onto that surface. So that's what we set up in our basements in the summertime. And that's why we all have so much mold going on in our basements in the summertime. Um, other places that we end up seeing moisture, excess moisture in our homes is in bathrooms. That's pretty common. Uh, bathroom ceilings, uh, even bathroom walls, uh, because it's a moist environment. We, we add a lot of moisture in bathrooms. And um, you know we can talk a little bit later about how we deal with these, these areas. And of course, we talked a little bit about the leaks um, before. Those are a little bit more obvious. Um, Aaron, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, at least um, to kind of help calibrate people is uh, Ron was saying water a lot in areas where water is. And those are kind of synonyms. If you're dealing with water in those areas, then you're dealing with a mold risk in that mm. area. Yeah. Um, and not only just mold, you know, uh, a lot of mites and spiders and uh you know bacteria they love that water so you know you're not just at risk for mold you're all of these other ooky things that you kind of don't want in your house um so definitely following where that moisture is 
you're going to find mold there. And if it's not there now, then it's at risk to do it. Um, it takes about a, a day for mold to start growing where water is. So, you know, even if you spill over a cup of water, you really should wipe that up right away. Um, same with, you know, if something spills over on your bathtub, don't let that water just sit there because it's going to get stuck in the grout or any little crevice that the water can, droplets can get held. You know, that's going to, I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your showers, all of a sudden it, that really wet environment, you leave that water just to air out, it's still going to have a little wetness to it and allow for that mold or bacteria to change that color and start growing on that surface. Yeah, I've even seen mold growing in people's closets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, it, 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 the heat doesn't get in the closet like it should in the closet, especially on an exterior wall. You know, it can get, it can get cool enough in the closet to condense moisture. Uh, even behind furniture, dressers, and things like that that are up against exterior walls, those yeah. walls on the inside can actually hit dew point. Um, especially in the winter and um, mold can grow there. So this is just, some, you're just, just constantly thinking about where am I creating moisture in my house? Yeah. And sometimes people will all of a sudden run into new issues um, when they're renovating. You start renovating a house, you're changing the way your home breathes. And so ultimately that moisture air starts moving from one area to another one it wasn't before. Um, you know, it doesn't always happen, but uh, Christy, maybe you can link in the chat for our guidance document on renovating right um, and being mindful of your air quality, because ultimately you are changing your indoor air environment when you put in that wall or take down that wall. It's something to just kind of be mindful of, of your home is a you know, a little, its own little ecosystem. And once you start moving things around, you could really cause health symptoms if all of a sudden you started creating a moisture issue in an area that it wasn't before. Especially with people, you know, insulating right and things like that. Our homes are being built tighter and tighter. And so all of a sudden we need a more risk or we need more ventilation to offset that tighter environment. So we can move on to the next, next one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So a lot of people are worried about what mold can do, and it all kind of goes down into these two key areas. You know, what does it do to my building? And it all will do the same, whether we're talking about an apartment unit or a house or a hospital, a classroom, it all does the same thing in terms of, you know, what it does to our building. And the, the health issues um, can have a variety, and we'll talk about that too. But these are the major areas of concern of what mold does when you're exposed to it. So we can move on to the next slide, and Ron, you can take it away. Yeah, sure. Um, so in building issues, we can have lots of mold problems that are really just affecting our buildings. And that's, you know, luckily, uh, a lot of times these things don't affect the people that are living in them. But, you know, so the, the exterior of your of your home, uh, if, if, if you're having leaks, you know, around your windows or through your siding, or as I, as I said before, at intersections of different, you know, building sections, um, you know, moisture can find its way into, into the building structure itself. And, and you may not, you may not know it for years and uh, you might go ahead and do a project. It's happened to me a few times uh, doing a project. You, you open something up and my gosh, everything is just rotted. And that's, that's fungi. That's fungi eating your wood, eating your house. Um, and depending on, you know, you know, how leaky those walls are in terms of air movement through the walls that, you know, that may or may not be causing a, a problem of, of exposure to fungi inside the house to, you know, to the occupants of the house. It might simply be a, I'm rotting my house problem. Um, obviously this picture that's up here in this bathroom under the sink, that's obviously going to affect people's um, health in the house, or it certainly could affect people's health. health. Um, but it's also damaging the building. You know, that, that material, that would just have to be removed. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we need to think about, is it damaging my building? And it, it, can it expose the occupants of the building to, you know, mold? Any other thoughts? Yeah, one thing too, uh, that it does create, as most stereotypically, it creates that musty odor that you can smell sometimes. And, and be mindful that 
sometimes your spouse may be able to smell it while you can't. It doesn't make them crazy. Just some people have more sensitive noses and Ron will talk about that on the next slide, but using your nose can actually be a really key identifier in finding water problems or finding mold problems. You know, it makes that musty odor and you can kind of follow where that comes from, you know, does it smell stronger in the basement than it does in the living room, then maybe that's the source and maybe you need to look for a water problem in that area. And uh, with at least staining the surfaces, I have some people who are concerned with mold on staining surfaces, um, if they need to replace it or not. Um, Ron, I'm not sure if you have much history with uh, stained surfaces in your jobs. Yeah. Um... So sometimes it's just a water stain and, you know, colony never got, got a foothold and took off and started growing. Um, and, you know, those kinds of water stains, they can be covered up with, you know, um, different types of um, sealant sort of paints. Uh, but if, if, if something has gotten truly moldy, uh, I would advise people that that really needs to come out because, you know, mold that's dead, is is just as problematic as mold that's alive where you know we can be just as allergic if you will to mold that is is dead so if, you, if you've got mold in your house let's get it out we don't need you know we're always going to have some um, but when we have visible colonies that's where we draw the line let's get rid of them let's get them out of the house move on to the next one sure yeah, so health issues, um, that's always a, a, a big concern of, of folks. Um, you know, primarily when we're talking about mold, the health issues that are, are most common are, um, you know, aggravation of asthma and certainly other lung diseases and allergic reactions. Uh, and, you know, everybody has their own susceptibility to these, everybody has their own allergic response. And some people don't have any, any allergic response to mold at all. Um, and, you know, then some folks are just maybe irritated by, by mold. And really that's the, that's the most common health effects. Um, certainly you've probably heard on television shows and in and, and print some real scary stuff about mycotoxins, these, you know, toxins that mold produce. Um, uh, fortunately, those don't get airborne very well. Um, and it's really not the, the thing that we're primarily concerned with. Sure, sure, it's a concern, but if we're controlling mold the way we should to prevent the, you know, aggravation of asthma, and allergies and general irritation, then we're certainly gonna take care of any other potential problem that mold could present to us. So really that's, what, that's how we kind of need to think about the health effects of mold. Yeah. And it definitely doesn't mean, you know, you need to burn down your house just because you have mold growing in your house. Uh, you know, if you've been living there for, you know, 10 plus years and you've never felt anything and all of a sudden you see mold in your closet, it doesn't mean you need to get out of your house, go to a hotel and wait until it's fixed. You know, it's, it's totally a manageable thing. And if you haven't been feeling anything, then maybe you're just not sensitive to that. Every human body is different. It's going to react in a different way. So if, if you're not feeling anything, then maybe you're less susceptible to feeling those health effects. It's, it's very similar to pollen season where some people just can't take it when certain pollen gets into the air during a certain season while others can breathe easy and live a good life. So it's just really up to your body to have a sensitive reaction. Certainly you can have infections and things like that, but those are super rare uh, or at least very infrequent that, you know, like Ron was saying, really it's, it's not our main concern because usually these are the symptoms you get first because generally it's not, it's not much more than that. Yeah, I really want to caution people against um, being overly concerned about, you hear people say toxic mold, you know, um, and black mold, there's a type of, of mold, a species of mold that happens to be black and it happens to produce uh, one of these things we call mycotoxins, it, toxins that, um, that molds produce to sort of protect their food source from bacteria. Um, penicillin is a classic example um, you know, and it does us a lot of good now. We've figured out how to harness the power of penicillin and, and, um, and we use that to our advantage. But, you know, moles do produce, some moles, not all, some, some moles do produce these toxic compounds. 
um, but they are uh, they're, they're designed to, to stay in their area. They don't want them becoming airborne, airborne and, and leaving their area. They want them to, to stay in their area and protect their food source. Um, and, and really, this, the, the research supports that that's not really what we really need to be concerned with. It's very rare that somebody ends up having a problem related to mycotoxins from the mold in their environment. It's, it's, the, it's the asthma, it's the allergies, it's the irritation. Mm -hmm. Next. All right, who's that gonna be, Aaron? You or me, I, you want me to do yeah. that? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so remediating mold. Um, so when, you're, when you do have a mold problem in your home, um, Re, you you can do a di a, a do it yourself a diy remediation if you're if you're careful you do it carefully and if it's small enough and manageable enough um, if the if the mold contamination is large enough or complicated enough then that would be the time to bring in a professional and we've got some documents here um, and we've we've got some do we have links that we can send people to. Um, Certainly the, you know, the, the Environmental Protection Agency has some great uh, documents on how, how to clean up mold in your own home. And they talk about the size that, uh, that you can probably handle in your house um, and, and how you should go about doing that. And if the, if, the, if the contamination exceeds a certain size or complexity, then you probably need to bring in an expert. But maybe rather than going into all the weeds of just how you do that, um, having people access the EPA document um, would be a good start. And by the way, I just put the links to both the cleaning up mold document that everybody's looking at on the left and the EPA guide on the right. So those have been placed in the chat for people to grab those directly. Yeah, so that's the uh, mold remediation schools and commercial buildings. And then they also have one for aimed more at homeowners. Yeah, I always tell people to use the schools one because it's so comprehensive and it's still really yeah. well. Yeah, and it's, it's just understand. like a large scale of remediation. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, it's like yeah. in the beginning we were talking about mold is a water problem and how you address it is kind of in a similar manner. They just talk about it in a larger building, you know, but it's the same best practice. Yeah, and that's the point. Can't be can't be emphasized enough that you really have to deal with the water problem. If you haven't solved the water problem and you mitigate the mold problem, you're going to get the mold problem right back. You're going to be spending money again mitigating the mold problem. So you've got to figure out the water problem. And sometimes that's super easy to do. You got an obvious leak. You got a plumbing leak. You, you've got a window that leaks, and it's and it's now been fixed. Um, some of the condensation problems can be a little bit more difficult to recognize, um, but you know, the, so sometimes it's worth hiring somebody with the skill to come in and figure out exactly why it is you're, you're getting this water problem. Yeah. That's a great point, Ron. I, I run into a lot of people who call me and they say that, well, I have bleached my home, you know, five times and it just keeps coming back. And, you know, using bleach is, I mean, even in the, the state of Maine, you actually have to be a licensed pesticide applicator because bleach is that bad for your health um, to breathe in. So, you know, why keep exposing yourself to bleach or whatever, you know, foamy or, you know, uh, uh, fogging techniques, you know, to try to kill the mold um, when, you know, you're causing all these other indoor air quality pollutants, uh, you know, into your home when really at the end of the day, you're just solving that water problem. So you don't need to try to kill it. You're trying to remove the water because at the same time, you're going to be fixing it. So no need to expose yourself to all these foreign chemicals that you weren't breathing in before. And you know, what's even more awesome is, is, solving your water problems before you get a mold problem. Yes. That, I mean, really, you know, if you're doing a renovation, certainly make sure you've, you've designed the renovation so that, you know, you're not going to have condensation problems and, and leak, you know, make sure that people actually know how to install a window and flash it and integrate it with the, with the building wrap and et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff you really need to do. Solve your water problems before they become mold problems. 
And you'll find that in a lot of the resources provided by the EPA or from the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council. They, they're really in the preventing mold from growing in the first place, because if you just, mod they'll, a lot of places will recommend doing an annual moisture inspection, not a mold inspection, a moisture inspection to stop it from even growing in the first place. So if you just go around, especially in those months that, you know, you see that condensation on your windows or pipes, you know, you know that that's when your humidity levels and when you're having water problems, most likely. So just go around your house and uh, Christy, you can link in the chat um, a nice guidance document on, uh, you know, where to look in your homes and how to prevent it in the first place. Um, I know the council has one, maybe there's another one too we can link, but really it's, it's great to stop it from even growing in the first place. You know, our homes should be clean and dry environments, not wet, you know, soil infested, you know, forests. Um, so ultimately that's what we want. And you're going to be preventing mold and all these other ooky things from growing in your homes. So next, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, I think we're there. Yeah, so uh, basically we found that, or at least me personally, I, I go to these two the most. Um, they have a really great set of guidance documents. Um, the Maine and Air Quality Council, I, I know it does say Maine in the website, but everything that they've written is for any state, you know, any home with a water problem or a mold problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very easy digested of all these best practice guidance like the EPA, um, but they also, there's, it's just like scratching the surface. The EPA has so much more too. Um, there's some other great organizations as well for it, but I tend to keep coming back to the EPA and the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council. Yeah, the other thing too, if you're doing your own research as you should, you know, on the web, like everybody does, um, you can run into a lot of really bad information that might seem good. Um, the beauty with the, with the information that we have on our website, anything that we have linked, you know, on our website is good quality information. You, you won't go wrong. So... Yeah, we always make sure it's backed up. We got nerds like us on the committee. Um, so we'll, we make sure to take a look at, uh, you know, make sure everything's backed up by hard evidence, hard science, um, yeah. to make sure that we're really solving the problems and protecting people's health. Yeah. Next, which I think is the last. Yeah. Well, um, so many questions have come in in all different directions in the Q&A and in the chat box and then the ones that came in before the program. Um, so just to try to organize them a little bit, there are, there are some questions about um, when people have had a significant moisture event and, um, and they know that they've had a moisture event and they know they have the risk of mold growing. People are looking for just simple tips for what do I do? Like if one gentleman in the um, Q&A says they just had a major flood during those rainstorms last Friday. Um, so he wants to know, what do I do to next? Like, what do I do? Yeah, next? I can, I can start out. I mean, I'll, I'll just speak from my own personal experience. Um, in my house, uh, we had uh, a leak in our bathroom upstairs that leaked down through the walls. Uh, and my, my wife said, Hey Ron, why is, why is the drywall bulging? And uh, so sure enough, you know, we had a, a big, a big water problem and, um, you know, what we needed to do, that, that drywall wasn't going to be saved. So that was going to go. So I made sure I, I dealt with a water problem and not a mold problem. So I immediately, I got a, an infrared camera and was able to shoot, you know, picture of the wall and, and see where all the, you know, how far that moisture went on the wall and then just simply cut out the drywall and I was dealing with just wet drywall it's a whole lot easier than I could have waited a while and you know in, in a few days I'd have been cleaning up a moisture a mold problem which would have been a, a lot more complicated but deal with it fast basically um can you can you dry it out can you use you know wet vac and and, and blowers and such to dry stuff out typically drywall once it gets really really wet it's not even worth trying just just cut it out and and put in new um, but you know, flooring and, and maybe even carpets, you, you can probably save if you act quickly enough. 
Yeah, that's definitely the key word is acting quickly. It, it does take one day for it to start growing. I mean, it's, you know, and like Ron said, you know, he stopped the mold before it even started to grow, which is key. I mean, it is manageable once it starts growing. There is definitely um, best practices to make sure you're not kicking everything up to all throughout your house while you're remediating. But, you know, it, even if it's as simple as throwing a tarp on your roof to stop that water from coming in, whatever it takes to get that water to stay out. Um, and then like Ron said, dry it out, you know, whether it's taking out that sheetrock or, you know, getting big blower fans and drying it out, whatever it takes to get that water out as soon as possible is going to be key. And there are professional services that will come in quickly and do that if you need, if it's a, if it's a bigger job, then you can handle, you know, they've got the equipment, uh, you know, restoration companies to come in and, and try to prevent a mold problem from happening by simply getting you dry as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And above all, I'm just mindful of what you said earlier in the program that it's really important to just stop the water. You have to figure out why the moisture is there in the first place, because you could cut out the drywall, repair it. And if you haven't solved that in the first place, like you're just going to end up with the same problem. And so you've gone through all that effort and energy and cost um, for nothing. So, yeah. right. Um, so there have been lots of construction related questions, um, some relating to calculating dew points in wall systems and some um, just dealing with general you know, I have an old house, it's got a smelly basement, what can I do to try to help um, solve um, some of these things? And I'm going to leave it to you guys to maybe just quickly address things like ventilation, getting the sandwich right, and I'll put some of those building resources in the chat, but it may be more than you want to deal with, but yeah, calculating I'm going to put it to you anyway. <laughs> calculating dew points in a wall, but you know, if you're designing a new, a new structure, a new house, um, you know, and you're, you're, you're thinking about the insulation system, you know, knowing where the dew point is in the wall system and where the insulation, different types of insulation needs to be installed because of that is important. But we, we're just not going to go into that level of detail here. But we do have resources that can point people to if, if they want to get that nerdy. That's pretty nerdy. You know, you got to calculate where your dew point is in your wall. It's important to do. Um, but uh, let's, let's have, have people look at that. And then what was your second point? So with the uh, older homes, one thing I was thinking of is uh, vapor barriers. Uh, I find a lot of people with, you know, dirt basements um, oh, yeah. that that tends to have a lot of mold problems. And sometimes, you know, our homes breathe, so it'll carry all that mold. Even if you keep the door shut, there are cracks and there's pipes, you know, if they're not filled completely with water, air can start breathing through those weird cracks that you wouldn't think of. Um, so I find that vapor barriers can be a great help for situations like that. People do a really good job of just sealing that dirt, and keep that water out. Yeah, there's a, that's for sure. Um, it, it just boils back down to that whole dew point thing. Uh, you know, you've got that, you know, old basement and, um, you got moisture coming up from the soil. You could have moisture coming in from the outside because it's fairly leaky. One thing that people like to do in the summertime is they're, they're inclined to ventilate their basement. It's the absolute opposite of what you want to do. You want to not ventilate your, your basement because basically if you're ventilating your basement in the summer, you're just continuously bringing in even more moisture to condense on your walls. So you want to limit the amount of moisture you're bringing in. Don't, don't ventilate your basement, you know, seal it up. Um, and an, an, another thing that you can, you, you either need to, if you're having a mold problem, you're either gonna need, need to raise the temperature or lower the humidity. Um, and it's sometimes it's pretty hard to raise the temperature in your basement. So lowering, lowering the humidity is key. So there are dehumidifiers that are made precisely for use in cold spaces like basements. Um, a lot of the typical, you go to the hardware store and buy a dehumidifier may not work that well. Um, I don't know if we can mention brand names on, on this show or not, but I know this, yeah. I'll, I'll like, pop I, I'll, I'll, I, I can say I own a Santa Fe. It's in yeah, my me too. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, works like a charm. It's, the, it's like the Sahara Desert down there. Um, nothing molds, so, yeah. I'm even going, can I tell people where they can get those, Heather? Is that okay? Main purveyors? Absolutely. I'm, I, okay, great. 
I'm I'm going to put a couple resources in the chat if people want to buy them. They're they're great because they dry a lot more for using way less electricity. So um, they're they're absolutely fantastic, and you can hang them too and have them pump. They'll pump up and out. So yeah, mine drips into my laundry yep. slop sink in the basement. I'll take you know there's condensate taken care of. Okay, I can't ask questions and tap at the same time. I'll come back to that. Um, so I, I think there have been a lot of questions about condensation on, and you've answered a lot of that. Um, condensation on window panes, condensation in bathrooms, condensation yeah. in other areas of the home. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about monitoring your humidity um, to prevent some of those issues? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you want to keep your humidity, you know, certainly lower than 60%. If you, you know, lower is better. 50% um, is great. I want you, you know, trying to keep it at, you know, 40% here in Maine might be pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, the EPA loves to say 40%, but yeah. it's, it's hard. So usually they give us the break of 50% in some regions, but the basement's hard to maintain too. So that's definitely what Ron said. Try, try to keep it below 60 if you can. Yeah. If you live in the desert Southwest, it would be hard to keep it as high as 50, right? But yeah, <laughs> you just couldn't do it. But, you know, so we have our challenges. Um, so yeah, try to keep try to keep that humidity certainly below sixty percent relative humidity, and fifty would be a good target. Um, and then you know the thing with with bathrooms there there are things you can do. Uh, ventilating your bathroom is important. You're sizing your your bathroom fan so that it it has the capacity to remove the amount of moisture that you're generating. And I think the 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 folks who make those bathroom fans all have apps on their websites that'll help you you know, sort out just what size fan you need based on what you have for fixtures in your bathroom, the size of your bathroom. Um, and then as an industrial hygiene geek, um, I actually calculated all my, because I, I had to duck mine a, a fair distance. So I did all the calculations for losses and the vents and all that. So you can get super geeky with that if you want. Um, so making sure it's properly ventilated is key. Yeah. Um, one thing that I fell in love with is the ones that have the timer on them. Mm. I'll, I'll turn mine on before I even start the shower and then I'll leave it going. Even after I'm done, I'll, I'll just put the timer on. Um, those have been really helpful for just making sure it keeps going. Cause you know, you still see the fog on your shower. At least I do for how long I shower. I still see that fog there. I know what I did and all that moisture is going to be in there. And uh, some, even in new builds, I've been very surprised going back to your piping, Ron, uh, venting that out. I, I've been finding people with that, that piping where your fan is connected. It just goes into the attic. Oh, that's uh, bad. Yeah. oh man, that just grinds my gears. Um, yeah. and, and, and then otherwise they dump it into the soffits on the outside, which is also bad. Yeah. yeah. So uh, be mindful of where that air is going, make sure it's actually going out and going out in the right way. So it doesn't all of a sudden trap in a different area that's coming from your bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Another problem that you see in bathrooms with, with condensation is, is if your bathroom is on, you know, is under the roof. So if you're on the second floor of a colonial, let's say, or the bathroom's on the first floor of a ranch um, and the bathroom's on the outside wall um, and you've got a ventilated roof. So that means you look in your, 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 your eave soffits, you've, you've got you get little screens there that you can air air goes up. And that, the idea of that is it's ventilating the roof deck, and that's a good thing to keep moisture from condensing on your roof deck. Or when it does condense, it sweeps it away. Um, but the problem that occurs is if they if the builders didn't install a proper insulation baffle inside your uh, inside the attic to prevent air from simply washing up from from wind driven air from washing up through your soffit vents into your insulation. So it's almost like the insulation isn't there. So you'll see on the outside, on your ceiling in your bathroom toward the exterior wall, you'll see mold growth. I've seen that over and over and over and over. And that's, that's typically the cause is, is poorly installed insulation baffles or, or lack thereof. 
Um, and we call that wind washing. So typically you've got around here, a lot of um, fiberglass insulation laying on top of your ceiling plane. So the wind, the cold wind washes into that insulation and cools that ceiling um, surface, certainly toward the, you know, toward the exterior wall. And that's where you get the mold. And you may not see it more on the interior side of the ceiling, but um, that's, you know, that's what goes on there a lot. So correcting that can be a little bit more tricky, um, but, you know, that is, that can go a long way toward preventing mold from recurring if that, if that is your problem. Um, and yeah, then we don't thing- really like expect you to remember, you know, as all those construction folks in there, I mean, <laughs> please remember this stuff. Um, but your average homeowner, I know it's hard to remember all of this stuff and, you know, about your house. It's a, you know, we just want to live in our homes. We don't want to take care of them, you know? Um, so being mindful, there are individuals who this is their job. This is what Ron does. You know, you hire people like Ron, these certified industrial hygienists is what they're called, or, uh, you know, certified home inspector with, you know, there's different certifications they can have to properly check for your indoor air quality. It's, it's not a bad thing to reach out. Even if you've been living in your home for 10 plus years, it's nice to have a trained eye come through and find all these things that you just didn't realize, you know, in Ron's case, oh, there is mold always growing in that corner, you know, and then you have someone like Ron come through and like, yeah, it's from so-and-so you should fix that. And it'll all of a sudden stop that from keep coming back. You know, there are professionals out there that this is what they do for work. Another super easy thing that a homeowner can do though, um, installing a fan can be difficult, right? For a homeowner job, but you can, you can paint the ceiling of your bathroom with gloss paint that that will help um and and what that does is the gloss paint it won't prevent condensation from occurring but when you have um flatter paints there's a lot more surface area and it can absorb a lot more moisture that the texture of the paint can absorb and hold a lot more moisture and it sticks around longer the 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 gloss paint dries quicker so it's a step in the right direction, I, you know, and really all these things should, should, should occur. You should have, you know, well insulated, properly baffled, you know, insulation in your attic fan that actually works the way it should and throw some gloss paint on your ceiling. That's a great point. It works great. I can yeah. attest. <laughs> Do you have a directory on your website, Christy? For mold professionals? We do not. We have the list of our membership on there and people could look for people who are members of the council who are also maybe in the mold remediation category. So that's at maineindoorair.org. But I, I know that question was, you know, getting into the whole issue of of professionals to do proper cleanup and repair. Do um, you guys want to talk maybe about how they could find someone to do that. And I think in the process of doing that, you may want to deal a little bit with the thorny issue of testing. Oh, testing. <laughs> My world. <Right. laughs> Ron, you want to go ahead with finding professionals? Oh my gosh, finding professionals. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, call, I call Christy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, it's going to be yeah. a cop out. Um, you know, I, like it's been alluded to the fact that I'm a certified industrial hygienist. Um, and frankly, not all CIHs know indoor air quality. Yeah. So that's not necessarily the go-to um, because, you know, we all have our areas of expertise. Um, you know, I, how would I, how would I I know it's the hardest to like yeah. find some, I, I find a lot, I mean, these people you can call up and just have a conversation with the issue you're having. And if it seems like they're knowledgeable and, you know, you see they have at least some education in indoor air quality background and stuff like that. I mean, and I always shop around, don't just call one person and think that they're going to be the right fit. They may not. Okay. Here's a, here's a, certainly a yellow flag, maybe a red flag. If you call somebody and they immediately are, are talking, I'm going to come in and start sampling for mold. That should at least be a yellow flag, um, because you know what we really what we really are doing is we want to find moisture problems. And if I sample anybody's home, anybody in the audience right here, if I went into your house and sampled for mold, I am absolutely going to find mold. Right? It's in everybody's house. It's everywhere. Um, so. 
in you know collecting mold samples um, and analyzing the data that you get from those um, it takes expertise it it takes money to do the sampling it takes money to have you know Aaron's lab do the analysis um, and really when you can just cut to the chase and, and go find what the moisture problem is um, so the 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 first thing the person should be talking about is, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to hunt for where the moisture problem is. Um, and that's, that's the person you want to give um, more attention to. Yeah. One thing, uh, at least in terms of testing, I, so mm -hmm. I manage a lab that provides the analytical service for it. And so you can certainly easily test yourself if a surface you're not sure whether it's, you know, molds or if it's dirt, you know, candles can admit a, a soot um, on our walls that can sometimes look like mold and sometimes people start trying to find where the water is and then it's not actually from mold it's it's from burning too many candles and you know maybe a men functioning system or something like that causing those black spots on the wall so you certainly can do that easy surface test yourself um but when it comes to air testing a lot of people want to know what's my air quality like and it's it's not just a home depot or amazon kit that's going to give you those answers they certainly try to take your money and try to do that but it, you know, I, I find the most value out of hiring a professional who's going to do that building walkthrough um, for you. If, if you can't do it yourself, then hire someone to do that and then add on the mold testing. If, if they think that that's going to prove their hypothesis of, you know, I think you have mold growing behind your walls, but you don't want me to cut a big hole in your walls. So let me take what's called a wall cavity sample. That's just a small, you know, can sample back there just to like check, you know, it, it's kind of like a, a different tool that they can use, but almost always you, you may not need it. Um, if, if it's obvious enough on a, on a surface or it's obvious with a leak, um, you know, or a water stain, you know, in those cases, you probably don't need it, but where it's invisible and sometimes you can't see it or smell it, then maybe in those instances, you may need to get somebody to come in and collect air cases in that. Yeah, and the other thing that we need to talk about in terms of testing is that a lot of folks want to know if they're being exposed to a hazardous amount of mold. And unfortunately, we can't do that. You know, there may be one or two very specially trained doctors in the whole United States that could probably do that. Um, but we just don't have, you know, the science that we have just doesn't support us doing that. Um, as opposed to as a certified industrial hygienist, I might be asked to go to an employer's work site and sample um, the air for toluene where their painters are using a paint that contains toluene and see if they're exposed to a hazardous concentration of toluene. Well, we know what a hazardous concentration of toluene is. Science has determined that. And I can go sample and I can get the results and say, yeah, look, you guys are, are overexposed or no, you're, you're, you're 100 times below. We don't have to worry about this one. You know, anyway, we don't have those sort of limits for, for mold, we can't test the air and say, yes, this is a hazardous concentration or no, it isn't a hazardous concentration. Part of the problem is, is the vast array of people's susceptibilities you know, to the various health effects. Um, there's the, the problem that there's just way too many different types of air contaminants that mold can produce. Um, you know, fortunately, we don't have to worry about all that. Really what we wanna do is, is don't grow mold in your house. You, don't have visible colonies of mold growth in your house. You're gonna have you're gonna have stray mold everywhere because it's in the environment. It's outdoors. It's everywhere. We live with it all the time. But just don't be don't have a farm in your house. Right, and then take those proper precautions to redefine the moisture problem, and then mm -hmm. take those efforts to fix it. That's often what I tell people when they ask me, I need to test my indoor air quality. You have to sort of think about what's your ultimate goal. You know, if your goal is to solve the moisture problem, you don't necessarily need a test because you've already got your eyes and your nose, which are your two best pieces of testing equipment. Um, so if you're seeing it and smelling it, then look for the moisture problem and, that, and then go from there. Yeah. And if, if, if um, viewers are concerned about testing their environment in their home for hazardous substances, please test for radon. 
please test for radon. That's the one thing we know what limits we should be complying with. It's easy to do. Aaron's lab can send you a test kit and you can send it back to her and they'll, they'll tell you exactly what's, what's in your air and, and then you can determine what you need to do about it. And generally the fix is, is reasonable. You know, you should be able to, you should be able to get a, a, a rate on an air mitigation for 1500 bucks. Yeah. It's super easy to do yourself too, which is great. You don't need to hire someone to come and collect it. Super cheap, super fast. Yeah. And winter's coming around, so that's the perfect time to test. <laughs> that's from old. Yeah, I'll test for radon. Test for yeah. radon. Yep. Yeah. So uh, there have been a lot of questions that were asked prior to um, tonight's session about mold in unusual places um, and how you address those. So the list is interesting. There's mold in a greenhouse, okay. mold in a toilet bowl, mold in the refrigerator. Um, coils, mold uh, on heat pumps. Um, those are the big ones that I've seen that perhaps you'd like to just tackle those hmm. weird places where mold are growing. <laughs> weird. Some, yeah, yeah, not all that weird. Um, again, it boils down to keeping things clean, warm, and dry. You know, when I say warm, you know, above the dew, temperatures are above the dew point. So, you know, I'm not sure the inside the toilet bowl is going to be mold, but it might be. Um, yeah, be. I get that one a lot. It does yeah. tend to not be. It's usually bacteria, but there's certainly some instances of it being yeah. mold. It's and the rare. beauty, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a ceramic product. So just, you know, clean it up and, and don't get too worried about it. Just, just keep it clean, clean, clean warm and dry. And refrigerator coils, it's probably because there's dust on the coils and um, you just need to be cleaned, vacuumed up and cleaned. Um, you know, do that regularly and your, your fridge will run more efficiently uh, and, and your, your health will be happier. Um, the greenhouse green. is going to be a little tricky. Well, yeah, because yeah. you yeah. probably want a moist environment. Yeah, yeah right. that's what the plants like. They like high humidity and that's, you know, indoor plants are not great. You know, they look beautiful, but my gosh, they increase your humidity indoors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's a battle. And the other one is, you know, sort of older homes with single pane glass. Um, even if you've got storms, you know, basically that you know, the, with, with our modern double pane, triple pane windows, you know, you got some insulation so that the inner, you know, the inner surface of the glass stays hopefully above the dew point, you know. Um, I know in my house, it, 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 it condenses. Um, I've got double pane windows, it's good windows, but um, it, it, you just can't beat physics. You know, physics says if, if, it, if you hit, a surface hits the dew point, you're gonna get condensation and there's just no way around it. So how do you, you either have to reduce the humidity or increase the temperature? One thing you can do for windows is make sure you don't have air leaks. So you're trying to seal up the air leaks if you can, that will help, especially with those older windows. Yeah, lots of moisture problems in old homes as those of us who own them can probably attest. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so there was a question that came in in the chat about recommendations for a good homeowner moisture meter. And I'm not sure if the term moisture meter really means that they're asking for a good, something that will help them monitor the relative humidity to help them keep dew point at bay or whether they're really talking about a more a professional type of <laughs> moisture meter, which can measure moisture in weird places like inside walls and under floors. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if, if the asker of that question wants to clarify, are you looking just for, well, maybe we can answer this. The second, a, a homeowner, something, a moisture meter, something that does the more technical inside wall cavities and places. Do you have a recommendation, yeah. Ron? Well, you know, certainly get yourself, a, you know, a relative humidity meter, right? Go out and, and buy one or two of those and put them in different places just to make sure you're keeping your relative humidity in, in control. Um, you know, there's different kinds of moisture meters. There's, you know, the little pin moisture meters that people use, like woodworkers use to make sure their, their wood is at a certain humidity or, you know, certain moisture content. So, you know, you could use those. Um, 
Um, I guess the question that I might want to know that might help Ron out would be, where's the moisture that you think you have and what type of a meter you think, you know, where do you think the problem is that might be able to help match the device to the moisture? Yeah, right. Let's come back to that if we get- Yeah, we can come back to that. Yeah. There have been quite a few questions about rental properties. Um, and um, the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council has developed a lot of process documents and resources for landlords and tenants to help them work through those issues. I will put that resource in the chat, but in a lot of times, the problem becomes less about the physical issues in the building and more about the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. And some of our resources do try to help get at that. Mm -hmm. But Aaron and Ron, I guess my question for you to help out those people who are in rental property situations where there are mold issues, you wanna give them some tips for things that they can do to help do what they can in their own environment to help reduce the risk to their health. Sure. Like uh, one thing is the quick and easy cleanups, you know, uh, using your eyes and nose to follow where the smells um, and where that water is, you know, uh, you know, take out your trash. Maybe that's causing the smell or moldiness, um, you know, cleaning up the, the bathroom. I, I usually find trying to find where that water source is and, and identifying that first and foremost may help your case to getting it fixed because at the end of the day, landlords will want to fix that because that's eating away their, their building. You know, that's, that's their investment is the building. You know, obviously they want to have a healthy place for people to live, but it is an investment at the end of the day. So if you can find what's a problem with the building, that's causing mold to grow there and starting to decompose their material. I mean, that might be a good jump in the right direction. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's hard if you're renting um, and you have a kitchen fan, let's say that just recirculates the air back into the kitchen um, versus pitching it outside where it should go. Um, you know, you, you don't have a whole lot of control over that. If you do, if you're fortunate enough to have a, you know, a kitchen fan that exhausted the outside, make sure you use it when you're, when you're cooking, um, you know, moisture, you know, water vapor from, you know, making a pot of spaghetti or something is a, is a contaminant we want to get rid of it, all that extra moisture that, that we would be adding to the house. It should be going outside along with, you know, the, the greases and oil smells and all the, you know, fishy smells or whatever the, um, that should all go outside. Bathroom fans, the same thing. If you've got bathroom fans, uh, make sure you're using them when you're showering uh, to keep the moisture levels down or, you know, running any amount of water. Um, you know, make sure that if there's a dryer in the apartment that that's vented properly to the outside. So you're not, re you know, a lot of people want to save energy and vent their dryers to the inside. That's not a good idea. Uh, consider water vapor as a contaminant that you want to go outside. Um, yeah. Um, in, in the temperature of, you know, if, of, of, of the rental property, you know, you're going to think, you know, you're gonna, how do you either lower the humidity or raise the temperature? And, and can you raise the temperature a little bit to help, you know, uh, create some, some more space to absorb some moisture so you're not, not getting so close to dew point? Um, can you think of anything else, Aaron? I punted to Christy. Yeah. The humidifier. I yeah, dehumidifier, sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a thorny issue, the real estate property, particularly here in Maine. Mm -hmm. So I've put that page in there, and I encourage anybody who had um, rental property questions to, can, to reach out to us afterwards, and we'd be happy to try to answer some of those specific questions. Yeah. yeah Whether, and then, go ahead. Whether you own them or are a renter, it's there's documents for both parties on that website. Yeah, and the dehumidifier that you would actually use in your living space, you don't necessarily need to go with the dehumidifiers we were talking about, you know, for basement use. Um, basically, when you start getting cooler temperatures, the nature of your dehumidifier is a little different. So you can probably get away with a less expensive dehumidifier. You know, the thing, the Santa Fe's we were talking about before can, you know, cost $1,000-ish, um, but you can certainly go 
with something much less expensive with, you know, if it's going to be in a warm environment. Some people do air purifiers too, or HEPA filters. Uh, Christy, I'm not sure if you want to link our guidance document about that too, um, about, you know, what to look for when dealing with uh, or looking to purchase one. The EPA has a great guidance document too for it, for air purifiers. Sometimes people will do that if they have a baby um, and they know they're dealing with a mold problem in the house, they'll, they'll put one of those in the baby's room during that remediation time, you know, things like that. It might be helpful to do one of those, especially if someone's having symptoms and you want a quick fix. Um, sometimes using a air purifier or HEPA filter will help get those out of the air. Yeah, and earlier we talked about places that you, you know, that you can get mold growth, the closets, the, you know, exterior walls with a piece of furniture shoved up against it, you know, where you might, the, the, the warm air might not heat up that surface enough to prevent uh, condensation. So anyway, think about, you know, think about those surfaces, uh, uh, exterior, the interior side of exterior walls, and do you have something that's preventing warm air from hitting that surface? So, you know, um, for, we want to keep those surfaces warm and prevent mold, mold growth. So as some of you may have surmised, a lot of this gets pretty technical pretty quickly, particularly when you're talking about construction. And Ron and Aaron have given you guys a lot of tips. But I wanted to just maybe to take a moment and just share some potential places where you can go to learn more um, about construction and moisture problems, because it's a particular thorny issue here in the state of Maine to make sure you're doing your either your home renovation right or your new home construction right so that you don't end up with a gooey moldy mess in the middle of your wall system. Yeah. So um, certainly green, the resources that are available through Green and Healthy Maine Homes magazine, if you're not already subscribed, I encourage you to subscribe and get the magazine. That's just a great resource for easy to understand articles about technical issues in your home, whether you're building a new home or whether you've got an old home. Um, there, uh, the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council does residential construction trainings, um, and there are resources listed on our website for that. Um, the There's um, weekly online um, builders and related shows called BS Plus Beer. Um, it's free and you can just sign up and you can participate in those weekly chats on construction issues and they deal a lot with, you know, sometimes lots of mold and moisture issues and again, the whole building science piece of how you put things together. And then there's, for those of you that are in the building trades or you want to put the right information in the hands of your builder, um, and particularly around moisture, Building Science Corporation to, out of Massachusetts has a huge amount of information about moisture in buildings, particularly moisture in homes. It's what they do. And then there is another non profit, well, organization, I guess they're not nonprofit, but they have just developed a vast array of great construction information. And that's an organization called constructioninstruction.com. Mm. So um, I will endeavor to put all the links to all those resources um, in the chat box for everyone to have later. The other thing that I would strongly recommend, whether you're doing your own, let's say you're, you're, you're doing a renovation on your house or building a new house, um, and you know, talking about the the exterior of the house, you know, uh, the structure of the house. Make if you're doing it yourself or you're hiring somebody to do it for you, make sure you educate yourself on on the components that are going to be used. And all of the manufacturers of, of the windows, the flashing systems, the building wraps, uh, the siding, they all have excellent. In information on their websites, all of them. And, you know, it just takes a little curiosity, go into their websites, find the installation instructions for the windows, for the flashings, for the flashing tapes, for the, for the building wraps, and make sure that all of these components are, are A, compatible, because sometimes they're not compatible. Certain window manufacturers will tell you that certain flashing tapes are not compatible with their windows. Make sure you understand that. Make sure they're they're compatible, but make sure they're they're sequenced right and installed right relative to one another. There's definitely a way that they need to be installed relative to one another. And 
Um, those websites are, are, are great resources, as well as the ones Christy has previously mentioned. Any other questions, Christy? I'm thinking we have time for maybe one more. Um, <laughs> you guys have asked so many great questions. Um, yeah. Are there any particular ones that you guys saw that came in that, that you'd like to tackle here? Um, I'm quickly scanning through that. I think we've answered most of the questions that people have asked tonight. Okay. Um, yeah, and even if we haven't, I always feel free. Uh, I'm, I believe Heather's gonna send around our contact information should anybody have any questions or you know wanna geek out with me and Ron anytime, always feel free. I'm always open for a good old geek session. So always feel free. Yeah. We'll aggregate all of the resources, all these great resources you put in the chat, Christy. We'll send those out in a follow-up email. Right. I'm just looking and, over the questions. I don't see anything yeah. that we can address. I think we've tackled almost certainly all of the areas of the questions, if not okay. the question specifically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't we go ahead and wrap up? There will always be lots more questions that come up. So thank you all again for, uh, for joining us tonight on the panel, for sharing your expertise. It, it sounds like uh, it's, it's quite an involved topic that does require a bit more follow-up research, but this certainly gives folks some really good resources and, and directions to go to get their questions answered. Um, so I hope everyone who came tonight, joined us tonight, learned some helpful information. Want to say thank you again to our sponsors, Royal River Heat Pumps, Senecal Construction Services, and Bath Savings. Thank you to Rain Rainer, who has been manage every, managing everything so beautifully in the background. You can't see it. Well, you can see her photo on the screen here. Um, and thank you to Christy and Ron and Aaron again for sharing your expertise with us this evening.